beautiful day, Palm Sunday. Thank you guys for coming. We're going to pray to start service. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will be in the midst of us today, that your spirit, your presence will be here. We thank you for this day as we celebrate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem as we lead on to your death and resurrection this week. Lord God, we love you. We thank you. Be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful that you are in our lives. The God of breakthrough is on my side. I love, God, that I've gotten myself into a huge mess again and again, and you seem to be so faithful to me, even when I'm not faithful to you. God, everything good in my life is because of you, and I'm thankful that you are here with us this day. I'm thankful that you are a resurrected God. 
And I don't have to wait till next week to know that you are alive and moving in this room. Today, I believe that you want to speak to every one of us about things pertaining to our life and the way that we live life for you. Would you move today here in this room by the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' glorious name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you guys have a seat for me? We have a special service for you today. Hey guys, my name is Morgan. Welcome to The Way. I hope you're enjoying the service so far. Here at The Way, we have four core values. One of the values that I personally really appreciate is the value of the Word. The Word is our foundation. The Word is where we get our inspiration. And I hope that you find here at The Way that you learn and you grow in how you read your Word. Knowing the Word is crucial to our spiritual growth. If you're new here and you want to know a little bit more about The Way, we want to know a little bit more about you too. That can happen at the Next Steps meetings. Those happen the second Sunday of every month. Here, you can take a spiritual gifts assessment and learn how you can get involved in the church. One of the core values here at The Way is our connect groups. In connect groups, you can make relationships, build friendships, eat some good food, and laugh. These groups meet at different times throughout the week. So find one, start going, and start growing. We have created different teams that serve throughout the church. These teams include the media team, communications team, worship team, and even a prayer team. Being on a serve team helped me make friends and feel like I'm at home. I recommend downloading the app. The app is called The Way Lakeland. You can get it at the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. This is where you can learn how to donate, how to sign up for events, and how to even sign up for next steps. So download the app. Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you experience God's presence and I hope I get to say hi to you. Welcome to The Way. Good morning. Welcome again to The Way. It's good to see everybody here today. Uh, we're gonna do attendance real quick. Get your cell phones out. Everyone's going to text BELIEF4 to 863-777-3520. And visitors, if you're visiting today, uh, go ahead and join us in this, and we're going to text you back, get some info from, from you, and we'll get a gift for you on your way out back there as you leave today. So visitors, go ahead and text in. If you're joining us online, welcome. And you're going you're gonna to put online next to your text in for us. Thank you. Some announcements. Today is the last day to donate uh, goods or uh, money for the Venezuela outreach. So if you want to do that, this is the last day. Uh, we're going to be shipping that stuff out soon. Um, we have a new scripture reading. There's a link to it on our app. It's for Holy Week. This is a, just a great opportunity to kind of connect with Jesus in his last week before his death and resurrection. And it's really powerful, some of the things that you can read this week with us. And we're all doing it together. On the, uh, it's on the app. So get to that. That's right on the front page of the app. And then uh, we have a Passover Seder coming up. Our, one of our connect groups is putting on a Passover Seder. It's going to be a teaching one night and then the, the meal the next night. And that's going to be April 9th and 10th. And you do have to sign up for that so we know you're coming. So do that for us. That's on the app as well. And then a parent leader brunch. That's going to be with our kids, pastors, and their leaders. It's a great way for you to get in touch with your, your leaders that are leading your kids, if you're parents. And uh, it's a brunch. So, I mean, food. Um, <laughs> It's awesome. Easter service is this week, Saturday at 6.30, and then Sunday at our normal times, just so everybody knows. Thanks, guys. Guys, I'm, uh, I'm pretty um, going crazy. I uh, woke up this morning at 3, at uh, the same time I always do, to pray for the service today, and uh, I've been studying for this message for about five weeks. I accidentally came up with nine pages of notes, uh, which is when the longer I study, the worse it gets. And I kind of boxed myself in a scenario. And then at about 4 o'clock this morning, I accidentally deleted my sermon. And I almost died. <laughs> so uh, what comes out today, I don't really know. I mean, I got some scriptures, and it's kind of all over the place. But um, I promise this is going to be powerful. Um, we're in week four of a series. And I think I studied more because of the three guys that speak the last three weeks. They all killed it. We talked about uh, we believe in creation versus naturalism. Uh, we believe in uh, Jesus, that he um, historically 
is accurate and by faith. And that, man, uh, and then last week we talked about everything that we believe comes because of the word of God, because we believe the word of God is inerrant. And uh, it was awesome. This week I'm tackling what I believe is the worst subject because no one else wanted to talk about it. So here we go. Uh, this is, um, we're doing uh, about eternity. We're talking about eternity today. And um, this is hard, man. I, I'm going to tell you, uh, if you don't know me, I, I, um, I, I may cry a lot, and um, I'm sorry in advance. And so anyways, here, cool. here we go. Uh, I do want to put a disclaimer out there. So while I don't think I've yet been to uh, etern- the other side of eternity, to see heaven or hell, I do believe that I'm qualified to tell people how to get there and what it's like because I've been on several planes, and I know that the flight attendant has never been in case of emergency, right? So how the heck does she know what the heck we're supposed to do in a situation she's never been in? Also, people study about space all the time, and they've never been there. And uh, there's a lot of things that people know about, right, like dinosaurs. But they've never met one. So I feel like I can tell you, besides, I know this guy who was talking to me this morning, and he said this, I am the living one. I was dead And now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Wow. Uh, God, you have my attention, right? Let's pray. Jesus, I'm going to need your help this morning. Amen. First point today that I think you all should know is that we are all going to face eternity. They did some studies and statistics, and they found out, they, 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 they checked 1,000 people, and it turns out, out of 1,000 people, all 1,000 people will die. Yeah. <laughs> truth, truth. Uh, out of a million people, one million people are going to die. Everyone's going to face eternity at some point in their life. Uh, and what I know is that what happens, uh, the way you live this life will determine what happens after this life. Uh, who was the guy from, from Gladiator? What was his name? Man, help me out. Maximus. He said, what are we doing life? Echoes in eternity. Yeah, that's right, man. That's, a, that's echoes in eternity. And so, so it's important the way we live this life uh, determines what we... Here's what Hebrews chapter 9 says this. He says, just as people are destined to, uh, to die once, after that they face judgment. Just as people are destined to die once... After that, they face judgment. There is a lot of questions that people have about eternity. Uh, many people will ask, um, you know, will, will I come back as a butterfly? Or, uh, you know, some religions would say a cow. Um, that, that's my uncle. Don't, don't mess with that, you know. Uh, they, you know I, some people will either, they'll come back a second time if they don't do this life good enough. Um, or can I repent later? And uh, what I believe the answer to all those questions is found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Just as it was destined to die once, and after that face judgment. Like, like not, not after purgatory, we die and then we face Jesus. Yes. Um, and it's important that you understand that we don't, we don't have the luxury of coming up with truth on our own. It, there's, there's 7 billion people on earth. What are the odds you discovered it on your own? We met Jesus, who is the guy who holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And the reality that we can have relationship with right now is what confirms by the power of his Holy Spirit that we know what we're talking about. Yes. Um, Jesus said it this way to the thief on the cross. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, he said. He said, I tell you the truth that today you'll be with me in paradise. Mm-hmm. Not in five years, not in 20 years, not after you come back and try to do a better job. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Man, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, after we, hang, we close our eyes here, we open them in eternity. Right. The second thing that I have found to be true, this is, not, this is not what the way church believes. I want you to understand. This is basic Protestant faith. Uh, from Baptist, Presbyterian, uh, Spirit-filled, Pentecost, whatever, whatever you are. This is like pretty much this is what we lean into today is that after we die on this earth and we face eternity, we're going to awaken ourselves to what the, everyone believes is called the great white throne judgment. And this is every sense of the word awesome. Yeah. Terrifying. 
This is goosebumps on steroids, guys. This is, um, and what's crazy is even unbelievers um, that I, I talk to, everyone, I think it's designed, God put eternity in our hearts. When you close your eyes, you get a sense of a moment sitting before the great throne. Scripture would say it this way in Revelations chapter 20. And then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before the God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. Man, whew, you want to talk about a moment in time. Jesus Christ would say it this way in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. He, he would, he's talking about how uh, in the last day, when, when, when he brings everyone to him, he's going to scatter. He, everyone will be standing before the throne, everyone. And he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And he says that the sheep will enter into eternal life. Now, the sheep are the ones that followed him, yes. not just believed in him. And this is a difficult thing, guys, like, whereas we're going to go on here. The goats are going, they're, they're, they can't be trained. They may know who the Lord is, but they don't, they don't submit. They don't surrender. They do what they want. They live life how they want. They can't be tamed. That's right. But sheep follow. Goats do what they want. That's right. And there's a difference. So we would continue on. Uh, the, probably the worst verse in all of the Bible, if there's a verse or a passage that gives me the most frets that I don't like or that I struggle with, it's, it's, it's this. In Matthew chapter 7, uh, he would say, but every, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. For many will come to me on that. Many will come to me. Many will come to me on that day and they'll say, but Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't I attend church every week and I held a door and I was on the worship team, and, but I did so many things for you. And listen, there's a, there's a difference between those that understand that he's the Lord and those that actually have relationship with him and follow him. I struggle with this. And he says, but I don't, I don't know you. Like, we don't have relationship. And I think that's the difference between those that understand that Jesus is the Lord is that I'm trying in my life, in my heart of hearts, to look for God every day in my life Amen. and follow him yes. and allow him to tell me when I'm an idiot and allow him to tell me when I'm wrong yes. and allow him to decide the direction of my life rather than me understanding that I have enough knowledge now of God to figure this thing out on my own. Uh, there's a passage here that I, I wanted to read to you. Um, Jesus would say, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives, whoever lives by believing in me. Meaning I've, I've learned enough to know that I know nothing. That's a sheep. I've learned enough to know that like, I could make money and figure out how to get by in life, but I haven't figured out how to find peace or hope or healing for my soul outside of Christ. Amen. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then Jesus says, do you believe this? Because that's what matters in eternity when he separates the sheep from the goats. This is going to be an important sermon today, I believe, for all of us, and I got to tell you, it's massively uncomfortable for me. But I believe that this will be the most awesome moment in my life. Revelations 22, verse 12, Jesus gives a promise to everyone that is one of his sheep. And I'm going to talk to you about heaven for a couple minutes. For those who are victorious will inherit all of this. I will be their God, and they will be my children. Look, I am coming soon, and I'm bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Man, that's... I figured out long enough to know that I'm wretched. And they will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit of the tree of life. And the spirit and the bride will say, come, 
Let anyone who hears this say, come. And anyone who is thirsty, come. And let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. So I want to talk to you about what it looks like when we enter into his rest. There's several questions that believers have. I was all over Google and asking friends from church, hey, what, what are our questions about heaven? And I narrowed it down to a few things. And um, here's, here's the, the probably the, the, the biggest misconception about heaven is that heaven's going to be boring. Uh, I think people think that we're going to float around on clouds learning how to play a harp and singing songs for, for uh, millennials like or whatever they are. Um, and... Um, not millennials. Millenn- yeah, okay, shut up. Uh, first thing I, I learned is that um, uh, there's going to be a lot of work to be done. I, I know this only because of who Jesus is, and I can see this when I look at Christ. So Jesus said in multiple times that he's got work to do, and he's always about his father's business. I only do what the father tells me. He's always on a mission. Jesus is always working. In John chapter 4, he's talking to his disciples, and they said they asked him if he ate, and he said, I ate already. Uh, we didn't see eat. He says, I ate. I, was, I, I, I had work to do. I did what the Father did. It fulfilled me. I ate, he said. Yeah. It's fulfilling when you're doing the work of the Lord. Oh, I can tell you work that's not fulfilling is when it's duty yeah. or like we're obligated to go make money. But I'll tell you, when money's not the, the priority in life, and you're living for purpose. I, I have a job, and I don't necessarily like my job, but I like who I get to work next to because they don't know that I'm praying to go and make sure that today they get to see Jesus. When I, that there's, a, there's a fulfillment in that. Amen. Jesus would say this. Uh, he would say that I, I, I have to leave, guys, uh, and I'm going where my father is. There's many mansions, and in my father's mansion, there's many rooms, and I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm working. I'm working for you. Yeah. I, I don't know if you understand, but in the very uh, Genesis, chapter 2, in the Genesis of, of man's relationship with God on this earth, he put us in a garden to work the land. We had purpose in tending the animals and tending the crops. We were always designed to work. Work can be massively fulfilling, and we will work for all eternity. What I love is I'd, love to, I'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of God. I feel like when I'm doing what God has called me to do, loving people. Yesterday, many of us went out and were raking and cutting down trees and sweating more than you've sweat. Like There are wives being like, why don't you work like that around the house? And, and, because it's so fulfilling to do it for Jesus, sweetheart. It's not necessarily... I'm just kidding. I got a <laughs> stepping in trouble right now. Trey's not in the room right now, so I can say, say what I want. All right. Uh, the second thing that I think that it's important for you to know is that um, we will know each other. Uh, now, it's important that what you need to know is that, so in Scripture, people, they knew Moses, and they knew Elijah, and they, they knew who Abraham was, and they even knew who Jesus was. But it's also important that you know that the way that I know you isn't going to be because I know what you look like because we're all going to be made different. So if you remember when they knew Jesus, they're walking with Jesus but didn't know who he was until they knew him, until he opened the scripture and then they, they realized who he was. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle Paul is writing and talking about how he longs to take off these wretched clothes. This skin, this, it's, I'm a prisoner, I'm a hostage of this, the bag of bones. And he says, I can't wait till I'm clothed in the new glory that God has designed me to have. Amen. And he's talking about this heavenly figure. Friends, I want you to understand that though people that you may know as like a 95-year-old, they're not going to be 95 when they get to heaven. They're getting some new legs, they're getting some new, they may be 14 when they get to heaven, you know what I mean? Like, and there may be six-year-olds that you know that I got a better beard than what I'm growing right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think what the heavenly figure that, but we're going to know each other Amen. in who we are. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There, there is a verse I wanted to read to you that I thought was so significant about knowing each other and knowing hardship and knowing the life that we've been through. Revelations chapter 21 verse 5, he says this, that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. I love that Jesus can make promises that I could never 
But there is a promise to some of you that have lost loved ones, to some of you that currently have have to fight through what's going on in your body. I'm making everything new. The third thing I think that is important for us to know is that, um, is that what heaven is going to be like is it will be unimaginably beautiful. I mean, we can't figure it out. I almost feel like the writers of the Bible were at a disadvantage because they were limited to what knowledge they had only ever seen in this earth. And so as they're writing the scriptures, they're trying to figure out ways to describe how glorious everything is. And they're like, yeah, there's this sea of glass and there's like streets of gold and there's like... Uh, What's awesome? Uh, it was like, it was great. Listen to this. He says, I saw uh, no temple in the city for the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city. What? Jesus. Light just ex- mm, comes out of him. Nations walk in the light and the kings in the world will enter the city through their glory, and the gates will never be closed day and night, and the nations will bring their glory and honor. I love uh, talking about how all of us will be together, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, yeah. every generation. We're all, I mean, you want to talk about beautiful? Man. Scripture says that the walls were made of jasper, and the city was of pure gold, and, the, and, the, and, and, the, and the, as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on the foundations of stone. Gates were made of pearl. Gates were made, I mean, he's trying to think of ways to describe. And as, as, as he would go on, he would say, look above his throne, there's like this, ah, there's like this rainbow. I mean, the colors are like, are crazy. And he, and he says, you know, out of his throne, he would go on. What's more glorious than, than, than heaven itself and the streets and the golds and the river and the fruit and everything that were the feast and he would say is the throne, and as they would try to describe the throne room of God as crazy, people that have had encounters with God would say that when they, there's like, it's like wave of glory after wave of glory. It's just overwhelming people. I don't know. I've not seen it. I've not, you can, but I know that every time a writer in scripture talked about the way they saw it, it was too much. Yeah. And they say it's like, the writer here is he's trying to describe the throne room of God in Revelation chapter 4 and Isaiah chapter 6. They're going to, Isaiah chapter 6, he says, man, like the train of his robe was so awesome that it just filled the glory of God. People didn't know what to do. It was just, it was even his robe was awesome. And, and Revelation chapter, chapter 6 is saying that, that it, is, it was like lightning just kept coming from him. It was so awesome. And thunder came, came out of his voice. And it was the sound of many waters. Was all, I was all over the place. Like, and I looked at him and I couldn't see, but it was like a sapphire or a gem. There was colors coming at me that was awesome. I, it was, wow, his throne was exalted above every other throne. Church, no eye has seen, nor ear has served, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those that love him. All I know is that he is awesome. Deb, would you come? I'm thinking about the throne and how awesome it is and how crazy fulfilling heaven is. I, you have to understand, I studied for this for a month and I can't put words to figure this thing out. Keith Green wrote a song years ago. I don't know if you guys know who Keith Green is, but he's like the craziest, weirdest, cool guy. Um, and uh, he's fascinating. And his, his revelation of Jesus was like nothing else. And he wrote this song, and he was like, you know what, man, think about this. God created heaven and earth in six days. In six days, he made the stars in the sky, and he made crazy awesome waterfalls and sunsets, and he did all this in six days. But Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for you, and he's been building it for 2,000 years. Wow. You ain't seen nothing yet, Jack. <laughs> but one thing I know that I know that I know that I know is that um, heaven isn't going to be about me or my new body or the streets of gold or this glass or this emerald or these rainbows or the... The, the sound that comes from his throne or the light, it's, it's going to be about Jesus. Yeah. Scripture would say this, that he, uh, 
This kingdom is like no other because this, this God, he actually walks among us. Revelations chapter, chapter 21 says. And he begins walking with us. And it baffles me to no end to think that my Savior would walk with me. But as I realize this, this has been the pattern of my whole life. The crazy thing about heaven is when Jesus separates the sheep and he lets me enter into rest, I think to myself, I don't, I don't deserve any of this. And it causes me to realize the song that they're singing in Isaiah chapter 6 and the song that they're singing in Revelations. They're singing, holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord. Why don't we sing like that? Why is it like when we sing like crazy? Holy is the Lord. He's unlike anything I've ever seen or done before. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The creatures bow before him and they're so amazed with awe of who he is Holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord. This is the song of heaven. You realize that there's, holy means he's not like me. I, he is pure and righteous and holy. And so this, when I think about the moment that I get to be with Jesus, I always tell people I can't wait because I'm going to hug him. I'm going to hold them, but every encounter in Scripture of those that encounter Jesus, the first thing they do is not hug him. Jesus, John, Jesus' best friend, John, hadn't seen him in 70 years, has a moment where he encounters Jesus in the heavenlies, and the very thing he does when he sees him, is the Scripture says in Revelation chapter 1 that he fell at his feet as if he was dead. He said he looks, and he sees, it's like hair like wool. And I look in his eyes and I see fire in his eyes. It's like he is glorious beyond glory. It's like power beyond power. It's like I immensely just feel like I'm dying standing in his presence because he is, wow, he's awesome. And every knee bows and every tongue confesses that, man, you are, you, you are God. You are the Lord of lords and the King of kings and I... Scripture says that the sound coming out of him is like the sound of many waters. It is power. Sounds like Niagara Falls coming out of his mouth. And what God's saying with this sound is, fear not. I love you. In church, all of heaven sings this song. You're holy. You're beautiful. You're glorious. And all Jesus wants to do is create a place for us to enter and to rest with him. He's glorious and he's worthy. And I'm not. But he's bidding us to come and experience this place that he's preparing for you and I. For the next 15 minutes, I'm going to ask you. You can stand, you can sit, you can find a corner of this room. Would you sing this song with me? And we cry.
but I don't want to move on. Like, I, I really, I feel like I was made for you. I was made to worship you. My soul doesn't feel better doing anything else than being in your presence. Like, the way that you restore me, the way that you're fixing all the broken parts of me, the way that you like healing me, that you're speaking to me about who, I, who I'm called to be. And what, like, I, I worship you, Lord, and I believe I was designed to do just that. Like, you are the best thing that is in my life, and I, I look for you. I'm looking for you, and I'm trying, Lord, to live my life to honor you. I pray that you would teach me how to worship you with my life, like with my life. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, oh God. I don't, I don't want to go on, God, but I feel like I've got, you want to speak to your church and I, uh, <laughs> I love you, God. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for healing me. No one loves me like you, God. You're the reason why I have courage. The reason why I have hope. You're the reason why I have anything good to give to anybody. Thank you for not giving up on me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, this is uncomfortable. You guys can have a seat. Um, Man, Clint, you're a good dude. Uh, this is going to be tough. Hey, um, guys, I spent way too long thinking about this passage, and um, I was mentored by a pastor in California, um, and um, during my job interview, he asked me, when I knew about church and stuff, and I told him about the power of God and like how I love to worship and stuff, and I love to like. He said that's not our focus. Um, I just didn't like him right away. <laughs> he told me that um, you can worship in heaven, uh, you can worship on earth. You know, you can you can fellowship in heaven, you can fellowship on earth, you can um, you can eat in heaven, you can eat on earth, but the only thing you can't do in heaven that you can do on earth is win souls. And he said, that's going to be our focus. There's a theologian that was asked recently, um, he died two years ago, his name was R.C. Sproles, he's probably one of the better theologians that lived in this time. He's not even of the same denomination as me. He's just good. <laughs> and uh, he, they asked him uh, what was the most difficult doctrine that he struggled with. And he said that of eternity in hell. And I'm thankful for that because I have so many questions that I don't understand about eternity in hell that I don't like. And I could write it. I'd probably write it a different way, but I can't. And so I got to shut up and submit to it and really lean into it. I think um, the idea of hell is uncomfortable, and so we avoid it. We avoid it. You know, like when the dentist tells you that you have cavities. I'm not going back to that guy. <laughs> or you look at your bank account, and it's not good, and you don't instantly come up with a plan to make do better with your finances. Instead, we just rack up more debt. Or like when you know your marriage is not in a good place, and you don't do everything you can to fix it. Or like when you find out your health is failing and you don't instantly figure out a diet and how to exercise. What's uncomfortable to us as Americans, we avoid. If there's a church with better air conditioning, that's the one we want to go to. We just, um, we like comfort. Comfort is the enemy of progress. Yes. So today I'm going to make you feel really uncomfortable. Good. And I believe that that's what God's asked me to do. So um, 
First thing I think you need to know is that heaven or hell is a real place. Uh, when they, uh, they, they polled Americans, more than 82% of Americans believe in heaven. But four out of 10 Christians only believe that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Like, without Jesus, we won't spend eternity in heaven. We'll spend eternity in hell. And to hear those kind of stats about the church, where are we at? We don't like comfort. We don't like discomfort. It's like, how many of you have watched Schindler's List more than once? You know, like, I'm over it. I don't don't like that. It makes me feel uncomfortable. The Passion of Christ, great movie, one time. (laughs) I don't want to see it again. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those that can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather be afraid of the one that can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Jesus' words. There's more than 162 references to eternity in hell in the New Testament, and more than 70 of them come from Jesus' mouth alone. So the guy that you believe in that's going to get you to heaven is the same one that's telling you that you have to be mindful of tragedy. And the problem that I'm having right now with the, with, with the church, including our church, I can't blame any church outside of there. I can only talk about me and us and what we're doing in here. Is that if we don't declare that hell is real, then what hope is there for those that have been molested or abused or forsaken or abandoned or taken advantage of? Because the reality that God is love is the same God that is the God of justice, which declares that his holiness declares that he will tolerate zero evil. And that gives hope to the broken. We don't like that conversation. But the problem is avoiding the conversation of hell voids the glory of the gospel. It's the reality that, oh, man. The consequences of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the reality is, is that sin is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. Like God said it. It doesn't matter what my opinion is on it. A lot of things I'd like to do that God told me no, that I don't want to do what he said. Like I'd like to keep all of my money for me. <laughs> like to build me a bigger kingdom. And I want to buy me a boat. And I want a bigger house. And I want more luxury. And I want to pay for someone to feed me every day. Right into my mouth. Hell is a real place. Second thing I think that people need to really, really, really be aware of is that um, hell is a place of judgment. Let me just take you there in scripture real quick. And then Jesus will say to those that are on his left, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Prepared for the devil and his angels. One of the myths about eternity in hell is that, yeah, we're going to go to hell. We're going to party. It's going to be awesome. I don't think you understand. Um, hell, it, first of all, you need to understand, wasn't created for you. That's right. Um, it was created for the devil, but you're going to suffer the same fate as him. Misconception, the devil's not going to torture you. He doesn't reign in hell. Those of us who don't serve the Lord in this life, who reject Jesus, will suffer the same fate as the enemy that stole Jesus' glory. And I think it's, hmm. there's this passage here in 2 Thessalonians verse 1, 
verse 9, and it says that they will be punished with an everlasting destruction shut out from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. And um, I, I think of that, and it, I, I want you to understand that there's a lot of differing opinions about what eternity in hell is actually going to look like, just like there's a lot of different opinions as those what it's going to look like in eternity in heaven. And what I'm trying to do today is present the most balanced version of it. Um, but when I look at presents like this, uh, it was um, one of our forefathers, Charles Spurgeon, who said this, that if there were no hell, the loss of heaven would be hell enough. Um, and eternity in hell is, is going to be being shut out from the presence of God. Once you know what glory is and what love is and what goodness is, an eternity apart from that is going to be awful. I don't like this message. Um, I'm okay. Thank you. I love you. It's my daughter, Mia. She's pretty awesome. She's the most beautiful. All right. Um, Jesus, I just asked that you'd speak. Because a lot of us don't know what to do with this. I wonder, um, why does God, if God's so loving, would he send people to hell? You ever think that? I did some research, and I leaned into this thought for a while for you. And uh, I have to go way above my understanding into some of the greatest theologians of ever. And uh, probably the best theologian that's ever lived is C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you guys have ever read anything by him, but he's... It's borderline genius. I'm grateful that he loved God. C.S. Lewis said it this way. I'm willing to believe that the damned are, in a sense, successful rebels to the end. And that the doors of hell are locked from the inside. Wait, what? We're basically saying that um, God didn't send anyone to hell. We chose a life without God. We told no God so many times that in the end, they, their will prevailed. Hell is a culmination of telling God to get out. You keep telling God to leave you alone, and finally he says, okay. That's why the Bible describes darkness God is light, but the absent of light is darkness. Amen. And on earth, experience light. We experience light, and it's like things like love and friendship and beauty and creation. These are all the remnants of God's presence. But when you tell God no, <coughs> you don't want him as the Lord in the center of your life, eventually you're going to get your wish. We have two options in our life, to live with God or to live without him. But if you say you don't want God's authority in your life, you would rather live for yourself. Well, that's going to be hell. This is the difference between sheep and goats. So I trust God with my life. I trust God with the lack of wisdom that I have. I trust God with my family. I trust God with my finances. I trust God with my health. But when I decide to take the reins and take control, now I'm living for me. I'm living in my wisdom, in my understanding and I'm going to earn this life. And I'm going to take these finances. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to build my kingdom. You think you know the way to peace? You think you know the way to hope? C.S. Lewis said in the end, um, in the great divorce, What we're afraid of is, is that in the end is what he does. In the end, there are only two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, and to those God says, okay, fine, your will be done. You, you don't want me? See, I think that what we think that heaven is is it's a kingdom built 
for us? No, that's the reward for the relationship that we've entered into. It's not heaven, like heaven, like I'm building heaven because we are one. Just like when you enter into a relationship with someone, so comes every, all the good things with it. But what matters is the relationship. Right. And the difference between sheep and goats, goats do what they want. Sheep follow, and they surrender, and they trust. I've learned that my thoughts are not his thoughts, and his ways are not my ways. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than mine, and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And it's pretty arrogant of me as a little man to think that I can define or understand what eternity should look like or what it should not look like. Here I am, the clay defining the potter. So here's my hope, guys. What's the point of this message today? Why are we talking about heaven and hell? I'm, I'm hopeful that my eternity is secure. Something that's really important you need to hear from your pastor that I think is important that we carry this on. I've done a lot of funerals. And it's a really important that you never define the judgment seat of Christ for someone else's eternal location. I reserve that seat only for the Lord. You say, oh, but they committed suicide. I know where they're going. I'm sorry, you know what? Only the Lord knows where anyone is going at any point in their life. And you always reserve that. We live life like everything depends on God. But I pray like everything depends on Jesus. But I live like it all depends on me. So it's important that we go out there and we tell everyone to get right with God. We go out there and we fight for people to love Jesus. We, we fight for people to understand the goodness and the generosity of God and the love of God. We live so generous and so kind and so forgiving and so merciful. But we pray like it all depends on Him. My God, that, that, that all they see is an idiot when they look at me. But you don't know what they see. This is anointing is going to come on you. I'm not making sense right now. Maybe I am. All right. Um, Sorry, I've been up since three, and I've been thinking about eternity. <laughs> I've watched Schindler's List eight times in a row and see how much you make sense, you know? <laughs> All right, this is how we're going to end here today. The only thing I pray is um, I, I can't wait to celebrate heaven, right? But really, I just want to uh, celebrate being with family and loved ones and the goodness and the generosity of God forever. I, I can't wait to celebrate Jesus. But... um. What's most important is that we walk away from this place with a burden for someone, not me. That's what love is. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. It's important that we walk out of this room and we give for those who are not us. That you sacrifice for coworkers that hate you or step over you or treat, mistreat you. We're going to be Christ for them, and we're going to fight for their eternal reward. We're going to fight for, co for family members that we don't like, and we sit at the Thanksgiving dinner table with, and they're annoying. You're going to fight to love them and show Christ to them. We have to live life with like a burden. You know the movie Schindler's List? I keep going back to it. I don't know. It wasn't planned. It wasn't in my notes. But my, one of my favorite scenes in any movie is the end of that movie, uh, where Oscar Schindler, it's a real story. And at the end of his life, he had saved thousands, hundreds of people. And they were alive because of him, and they were so proud. And he's about to go into his car and drive off. And he, <laughs> he looks at this car, and he thinks, man, why did I buy such a great car? You know what I could have done with that car? You know how many people I could have showed love with had I not just lived for myself? And he looks down at a golden pin that he bought for himself. And he thought, man, what if I would have just sold this pin? What if I would have given this pin to someone else? It could have showed them love. I could have won more people had I just not. And I just don't want to get to heaven having lived this life for ourselves. 
enjoying all the great things that God lavished on us. Forgetting how many people are going to be separated and they don't know about the goodness of God yet. Friends, it's not about you. It's not about our church. It's not about each other. And it's not about what pastor's doing for you or what we're doing for each other or what opportunity you get to be on stage. There's a generation that's dying and going to hell. Many of them will cry themselves to sleep tonight, drinking themselves into a coma because they're, they're looking for true peace. And they're going to fill it with whatever lie the enemy will put in front of them. Yes. We got to get over ourselves. So Jesus tells this story about this rich man and Lazarus, his servant, and they both die and they both spend eternity. One goes to heaven and one goes to hell and the one in hell realizes, man, this this is terrible. Can I just get a drop of water to cool my tongue? Can I just find some sort of comfort? And And they tell him no. And he says, well, how about you send Lazarus back from heaven, his servant, It's crazy because we go into eternity with the mindset that the authority we had here will be the same authority we had there, but you're not going to have any servants in in hell. You're not going to have any comfort. And Jesus says to him basically, he uses someone else's Abraham, but he says to him basically, um, they have Moses and they have the law, they have scripture and they have The purpose of this is for us to recognize that we are Lazarus in this generation. Now we have an opportunity to go to your loved ones and let them know that they're not living intentionally. Many of us are asleep at the wheel. This has been the most sobering year in mankind's history. People are still numbing themselves. So here's my prayer. Not that you enjoy heaven or worship today. I do pray that you enjoy the goodness of God. But I pray that you walk out these doors and live life with purpose, recognizing that eternity is far greater than the next 20 years that we've got. My prayer for you right now is that God put someone's name on your heart that you can love like no one else. You need to know that I can't pray for your coworker like you. I can't pray for your parents like you. I can't pray for your sons and daughters like you. I can't pray for your family or your cousin or your neighbor. God hasn't sent me to them. He sent you. And he anointed you with the spirit of Jesus to be anointed like Jesus, to be as wise as like Jesus, to be as generous as you have provision to love them like no one else. God, give us a burden. So I pray that over you, even right now in this room, Charles Spurgeon, one of the forefathers of our faith, he said this, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they perish, And let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. I pray that you fight for the people in your life to know purpose, to know Jesus, to know hope, and to know that he's alive, and to know that God is loving and that God is good. I don't know if you understand, but I don't think anyone, God sends anyone to hell. I think people choose to reject Jesus every moment of their day. And there are many believers in this room right now that you have knowledge that Jesus is Lord, but your life doesn't follow him. If you are real honest, you're a goat. You're untamed and you do what you want. You watch what you want. You laugh at what you want. You tell jokes like you want. You do what you want. You're the God in your story. Would you all do me a favor and bow your heads and close your eyes? I believe that there's someone in this room 
And God is going to give you an image right now in your head of the great white throne judgment where he separates those that are truly his and those that are doing their own thing. I believe that this is the most awesome moment in your life. If you're here today and you're not right with Jesus and you're not surrendering to him with every head bowed and every eye closed and you're going to say, today I get right. Today I choose to live with purpose. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. There are many at home right now online. I'm thankful that you're with us. He's saying today, you follow me. I pray over you, God's forgiveness and his mercy. I pray that you'd be washed in the blood of the lamb. I pray that the Lord would give you his Holy Spirit in which is going to lead you and guide you from this moment forward. He's going to direct you into all truth. He's going to lend you to be generous and forgiving and kind and merciful and good and wise. He's going to lead you into purpose tomorrow. Jesus, we give you our life. And we receive your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to me. It's super important that if, you're lead, if you prayed that prayer and God did something significant, that you talk to someone about it. These guys are prayer warriors right here. And we all week long think about this moment praying with you. Please don't walk out these doors without praying with them. We have a gift down here for you that's pretty rad. And uh, we want you to have it. Um, here's what I close with. This next Sunday, I think, is the, this week is the biggest week in Christianity. Some of you are asleep at the wheel in your faith, and you haven't grown or read your Bible in months. You're not alive in Christ. I'm not mad at you. It starts now. I'm your coach. We're going to do this thing. We're going to run harder. We're going to abandon everything else. We're going to run after Jesus. Here's what you need to know. This is Holy Week. This is the week that you learned that God didn't love the world. He loved you. Yeah. And that's when everything changes. When you know that he carried the cross to get to you. Man, when you realize that Jesus died for me, everything changes. So today's Palm Sunday. Everyone, all the churches say that this is like a great week, like it's all heroic. But you need to know, when you read in this week in Scripture, you'd find out that the same people that were praising him today were wishing that it were crucifying him a couple days later. And it's like an empty praise. We're trying to make disciples here. And so um, I need you to or go to the app this week and check in and follow us on Holy Week. We're going to read some scriptures every day together. And we're going to pray together every, every day this week. So join us uh, in the app. But the most important thing I think that you need to understand is that there are people that would go to church if you invited them. More than 70% of people say that they would go if someone invited them. That's bonkers to me. I, don't, I mean, it's like, come on, where do you get these numbers? Look, what if you inviting someone to church made an eternal difference in their entire family? We're preparing all week long for what the service is going to be next week. We think it's going to be special. Far less crazy than this, I swear. I can't handle this another week. So uh, next week, it's going to be nice. We're going to have a photo booth outside for people to bring their family and take a picture, and it's going to be glorious. But you have people in your life that are dying for you to invite them, your neighbor, your coworkers. Um, and so we want to partner with you to reach the lost for Jesus. We want to make it hard to go to hell in Lakeland. Amen? Amen. And if it ain't here, take them to another church. I don't, I mean, it. I don't, a lot of good things going on. We just want to get people saved. Amen. Father, let me see what you see. Hallelujah. Let me hear this week what you hear. Yes, but I want to grow, and I want to grow in Christ. And I want to be alive in you. And I want my life to be lived for you. There are people in my life that need to be closer to you. And I believe you can use me to do it. Help me, Lord. 
to reach people for eternity. And all Jesus' people, and all God's people said, amen. amen. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.